It's good to see the Burnhams. Please continue to keep Jen Burnham in prayer. Her stepmother passed last night. And her father, uh, during a season of Shiva, with the loss of his wife. Debbie, it's a blessing to have you here this morning. Amen. I want to you think about something this morning. <laughs> I'm going to make you think today. Darn that guy. <laughs> Linda's going, oh, no, he's going to do that. He's going to make me think. I want you to think about denial. I want you to think about denial for a moment. And I'm not talking about a river in Egypt, okay? I'm not, I'm not talking about denial. I'll be here all week. <laughs> Denial means to declare that something is untrue, which means a few things, which means either whatever is actually untrue or the something is true and you're just lying or you're just unable to or maybe even refuse to accept it as true. For example, there's a growing movement of people who believe the earth is flat. That the earth is not a round globe, but a flat disk surrounded by a barrier of ice. Some of us can't believe a dome covers the earth. If you've ever seen the Truman Show, one of my more popular and favorite movies. Amazing concept for a movie. If you've ever seen The Truman Show, a dome had covered his world. There are others who believe there is no dome, but we just stare up into infinite space. Either way, it's a huge denial to deny that the Earth is round. You would have to ignore much of modern science as well as believe that there's some sort of conspiracy that's been going on since the dawn of time that makes it worth it for whoever to cover up that the Earth is flat. That make every launch by the SpaceX rockets and every spacewalk by the astronauts in the International Space Station as it circles the Earth as being staged. It's all staged. Somebody... There's some, somebody behind all this, keeping us from knowing the truth that the earth is flat. But what if I were to tell you this morning that this is not the worst denial that we can commit? In fact, there's a much worse denial that we often, yes, all of us commit. And each one of us, one way or another, struggles with denying Yeshua, with which thereby compromises our ability to be faithful to And all of a sudden you go, no, no, not me, rabbi. Because <laughs> that's what you just said in your spirit. Every one of you said, oh, not me. He's not talking about me. Most of you think that. But I challenge you. I challenge you that we do this when we don't live according to his way or we don't tell others about him because we are embarrassed or we fear alienation or mockery. Whichever it is, that's denying Yeshua. That's denying Yeshua. It's actually much worse than denying the earth is round because what you believe and do about Yeshua has eternal weight. You may recall the thieves on either side of Yeshua as he hung on the tree in his final mortal moments on this earth. Do you remember? One mocked him, denying he was the Messiah, while the other begged mercy, declaring him king. In our text from the Ketavei HaShachim today, we encounter two forms of denying Yeshua, one or both we've all been guilty of. So don't be so quick as Peter was to say, not me. We find in our portion for Hagamatzot, or unleavened bread, the first denial, and of course, Judas or Yehuda, who rejects Yeshua, not just vocally, but he's rejecting Yeshua from his heart. 
He's rejecting him from his heart. See, it was at the beginning of the spring, Holy Moedim, the appointed days, the week of Yeshua's, of course, crucifixion and death. And at the beginning of this week, Yeshua, of course, we remember this, the account, he, he rides into Jerusalem or Jerusalem on a donkey to rejoicing crowds while, and, and who believed had, that, that he had come as Messiah ben David, that's the same Messiah Judaism is still looking for, Messiah ben David, to overthrow the Romans. But all but the religious leaders were elated with Yeshua's triumphal entry. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were screaming and hollering. They were jacked up. Finally a deliverer. In the days following leading up to Passover, those same leaders who weren't so elated about his triumphal entry were trying to find a way to get rid of him find a way to get rid of Yeshua, but they were unable to until we are told in the gospel account of Luke 22, verse 3, Hasatan entered Yehuda or Judas. He entered him. And Yehuda then, the scripture says, approached the head konim, the priest, and the temple guard, and discussed with them how he might turn Yeshua over to them. A reading from verses... Five to six from chapter 22, they were pleased and offered to pay him money. He agreed and began looking for a good opportunity to betray Yeshua without the people's knowledge. Because remember, they're afraid of the people. In order for a serpent, brothers and sisters, a snake, in order for a snake to cause you harm and, and subsequent death in some cases, what does it need? What does a snake need? A snake needs to get close. It needs to get close to you. Whether it bites you or whether it squeezes the life breath out of you, you've got to draw it close or be close to it. Nobody was closer to Yeshua than Yehuda or Judas. And the adversary, he knew it. He knew it. So entering Yehuda, the serpent or the snake found a way to get near. And now the betrayer is in the house. The betrayer is in the house. Partaking the satyrs side by side sat the protector of God's people alongside the destroyer of God's people. Intimately close. Concluding the Seder Yeshua, he went as usual to the Mount of Olives and the Talmudim followed him. Reading from verses 47 and 48, still in Luke 22, while he was speaking, a crowd of people arrived with the man called Yehuda, one of the 12, leading them. He came up to Yeshua to kiss him, but Yeshua said to him, Yehuda, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? So we find our first case of denial in Judas or Yehuda who follows through with his agreement to betray Yeshua for 30 pieces of silver. And although the Torah doesn't really reveal his motivation, we can reasonably assume some things. Reasonably assume he's at least influenced by the potential of financial gain. The price was right. Obviously, as a follower of Yeshua, he wasn't getting rich. He wasn't socking away a portfolio. He didn't have a house. He didn't have jewels, dimes. He didn't have nothing. So maybe he saw the writing on the wall for Yeshua. Yeah, Yeshua's days are numbered here. I better set myself up before he's gone. It's not an unreasonable thought if you have a worldly point of view. Why go down with the ship? We saw it in our government all of the last four years. Betrayal after betrayal, book deals, movies, interviews. All the people that were in the house are all set up pretty good right now. It's amazing how politicians go into government and come out millionaires, isn't it? I think 70% of them leave there as millionaires. So we shouldn't be surprised by really the motivation that Judas had here. 
for where your wealth is, Matthew Yahoo tells us, there your heart will also be, where your wealth is. His heart didn't belong to Yeshua. Don't fool yourself for a moment. It didn't belong to Yeshua, but to other things that he desired in this world more than Yeshua. And though he lived and traveled with Yeshua for three years, though he listened to his teachings, helped out, volunteered, his heart remained far, far from the master. If we look at it on a congregational level, one might love fellowshipping. You, you might love just being in the, with people. You might love being in a, in a congregation and fellowshipping with other congregants. You might love having opportunities to, you know, you're retired. You might have opportunities to serve and to help. You might like to do that. You might even be drawn to the structure of a religious environment. Perhaps, in our case, an affinity towards traditional Judaism. You like all the bells and whistles of, you know, Judaic structure and blessings and, and practices. And still, still have a heart that's not fully devoted to Yeshua. Matthew, Yahu, or Matthew 26, 24b, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him had he never been born. That's a powerful statement. Better off that you weren't born than to betray Yeshua. And when Yeshua prayed for his Talmudim earlier that night after Pesach, listen to what he said about them. When I was with them, said Yeshua, I guarded them. I guarded them by the power of your name, Lord, but you have given to me, yes. I kept watch over them, and not one of them was destroyed except the one meant for destruction so that the Tanakh or the Old Testament might be fulfilled. That one being Yehuda. And we know how it ends for him, don't we? Scripture goes on to reveal that Yehuda would hang himself. In Acts chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, the 30 pieces of silver he received was used to buy the field he died in, which became known, Scripture says, to everyone as Hakal Dama, the field of blood. Denying Yeshua in your heart is the worst mistake that any person will ever make. Take that very seriously. Denying Yeshua will be the biggest mistake. We can make a lot of stupid choices in this world, and I'm replete with a bunch of them. But I can tell you, the one mistake I haven't made is denying Yeshua. And I hope nobody here continues to, and I hope that nobody in this world ever does. But it's done nonetheless. You can go through all the right motions, brothers and sisters, looking and acting like a godly or a good person, because everybody's good. We've said that many times. Who's going to say they're horrible? Hi, I'm horrible. You going to heaven? I don't know, I'm a pretty good person. You've heard that, right? Everybody's heard that, right? I'm a pretty good person. According to whom or what? But according to them, they're a good person. I'm a good person. Maybe you're serving the kehilat behind the scenes, participating in services, but your heart is not fully sold out to Yeshua. If that's the case, you're, not, you're denying him. You're denying him. Yehuda, Judas, kissed Yeshua, he kissed him. That's an act of affection, brothers and sisters. But, it, but he wasn't devoted to him. He didn't fully love him. There are plenty of spouses who kiss their husbands, their wives goodbye in a day as they're on their way to their adulterous affair. They might care for their spouse but they're not fully devoted to them. That's the spirit that we're talking about here with Judas. Now, you may be here each and every Shabbat to kiss Yeshua by the spirit on a, on a, or on a holy day, yet I'm telling you, if you re redefine his way to suit your personal definition or comfort zone of who he is, then you're not fully loving him. You're not. 
and therefore you are denying him. For Yehuda, life with Yeshua, the gang that Yeshua hung around with, it was the Yeshua gang, right? For him, that's how he kind of viewed it. I'm hanging with the Yeshua guys. Life was a means to an end for him, for his own personal gain. He wasn't sure how it's going to play out, but he knew if he hung with these guys, they were like the happening thing, I'll hang with them. See how this all plays out for me. See, we can lift our hands and worship and praise and say the most amazing prayers, eloquent prayers, but if our hearts don't belong to Yeshua, it's like we're a, a foreign double agent living amongst God's people. Just act Representative Eric Swalwell and his nice little Chinese affair. She may have been very affectionate to Mr. Swalwell, but her love was not for him, but what she could provide, what he could provide for her. You can show affection, but not, but not fully be devoted. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. Just, don't just be religious or, or go through the motions. You've got to really love Yeshua. You've got to give him your heart in full devotion. Even at the moment that Judas kisses Yeshua, Jesus or Yeshua affords him an opportunity to repent. Did you catch it? By asking him if he is betraying him. Are you betraying me? So he's asking him, are, are you betraying me? That was his option. That was his out. That was his chance to repent. You could have said, no, you're right. No, no, no. I'm not going to betray you. I'm sorry. But he didn't do that, did he? No, he stuck to his plan. However we can, we could still, we could still say no. We could still, during these spring holy days, confess our heavenly betrayal of Yeshua, our leavened betrayal, maybe I should say, of Yeshua through our lack of complete devotion and lifestyle to his way. You know, the next person we encounter does not deny Yeshua from the heart. It's different this time. His heart is all in, though he kind of misappropriates things a little bit, but he's all in. When the soldiers came to take Yeshua away, Kepha, using the sword that Yeshua instructed him to purchase, you never heard that from a pastor before, did you? Yeshua instructed him to buy a sword. And he used that sword, and he struck the slave of a Kohen Haggadol, cutting off his right ear. The head, the head priest, he cut off the ear of his, of his uh, servant. So instead of one of the soldiers there to capture Yeshua, no, Kepha is a little off with his aim. He targets a servant instantly just doing his job. He wasn't there to do anything. He didn't have any agenda. He's just serving his master. Yeshua says, this is the insanity. He didn't really say that. I'm reading in the text a little bit. But he says, none of this. He heals the man. They have his ear cut off, and then he surrenders to his captors. Embarrassed, the brave defender, Kepha, or Peter, falls from a distance, the soldiers into the city. And we read in Luke 50, uh, still in chapter 22, verses 55 to 57, but when they had lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Kepha joined them. And then one of the, pay attention to this, one of the servant girls saw him sitting in the light of the fire. Staring at him, she said, this man, this man was with him, but he denied it. Kind of killed his witness, didn't it, real fast. No, he, he was with him, but he denied it. Lady, I, 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 I don't know him. I don't know him. See, whereas... Judas's or Yehuda's denial is from a hardened heart. Kepha's denial of Yeshua is due to fear and shame resulting from a broken heart. You can imagine 
the situation where Kepha works up his courage to follow Yeshua so that if Yeshua decides to take matters in his own hands to fight back, that he's ready to assist the mighty warrior Kepha. He's got a sword that the master told him to buy. But then he encounters a young girl. <laughs> he encounters a young servant girl, and she's just too intimidating for him. And then we read in verses 59 to 60, a little later, someone else saw him and said, you're one of them too. But Cave said, man, I am not. And about an hour later, another man asserted emphatically, there could be no doubt, dude, I know it. This fellow was with him because he too is from the Galil. But Kepha said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. All four Gospels, all four Gospels include Kepha's denial of Yeshua. With each account beginning with this humble little servant girl asking Kepha if he's one of Yeshua's Talmudim. Do you follow him? Do you live for him? If a little girl asked you that question, would you answer? Absolutely. You know, the basketball players at ORU are starting to go through that. Do you realize that? People are outraged that this basketball team that lifts up the principles and the ways of Yeshua are allowed to compete in the NAACP. Or, or, you know, NA, yeah. They're outraged. They're bigots. They're biased and prejudiced towards the people in the gay community. They're oppressive. They're outdated in their belief systems. How could you allow them to play against all these other teams? They're getting bad press. And sooner or later, you're going to watch it happen. You're going to watch it happen. They're being scrutinized. You know, just a short time before, we have Kepha drawing his sword and cutting off a man's ear, and now he's cowering under a little girl's scrutiny. No doubt he must be afraid to tell the truth. He's afraid to tell the truth, worried it might lead to the cross for him, too. It might cost him. But in all fairness, Kepha is relatable. We can relate to Kepha if you're honest with yourself. His heart's not in question. He loves the Lord. I don't think anybody's ever going to question anybody's heart in here for Yeshua. I think you all love Yeshua. I don't think there's anybody here not saved. So we can relate to Kepha. He believes Yeshua is the Mashiach. He declared it <laughs> more than anybody else, for, before anybody else did. But he doesn't quite understand the depth of what that means, but he's very much a Talmud or follower of Yeshua. He has no intention to betray him like Yehuda, but he's easily ashamed. He's easily afraid. For most of us, I think we're just like Kepha. We believe in Yeshua, but it's difficult for us to express our love for him, to reveal the truth about him, because we're afraid. We're afraid. We're afraid to put it out on social media, what the truth is in, in, in life. The truth is about what's really happening because we're afraid that we're going to be canceled, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. How many of you, how many of us will proudly declare we are followers of Yeshua and his way but are uncomfortable sharing the good news? You know, an author once said, walk in line with your prayers. That means pray, good, pray. Pray. But then act on your prayers. <laughs> act on your prayers. Pray about your coworkers' need for Messiah, and then go tell them about Yeshua. It's easy. Well, I prayed about it. Well, what are you going to do about it? Many of those same coworkers will feel an unwarranted sense of eternal security because tomorrow they will celebrate some dimension of Easter. So I'm probably going to heaven. I took the day off from work. 
and I celebrated Easter. I had my little basket. The ladies put on their white shoes. They went to church twice a year, and they're feeling good about themselves. During his ministry, Yeshua taught early in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, Moreover, I tell you, whoever acknowledges me in the presence of others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before God's angels. Kepha knew, he knew from the Torah how serious it is to deny Yeshua. And early that evening, Yeshua prophesied Kepha would deny him three times. But Kepha denied that reality as well because he didn't want to believe it or he couldn't believe it. Shimon, Shimon, listen. Listen, the adversary demanded, the demanded to have you people for himself, to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. Shimon, that your trust might not fail. And you, once you have turned back and repented, strengthen your brothers. Shimon said to him, Lord, I am prepared to go with you both to prison and to death. Yeshua replied, I, t- I tell you, Kepha, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. And that's what you're feeling when I give a message like this. Because you refuse to believe that you possibly are responsible for denying Yeshua. You don't like to hear that. Kepha didn't like to hear it either. And that's why he's relatable because each one of us feel the same thing he did. Not me, Lord. I'll go to the mattresses for you, to use a Godfather term. Hasatan laid claim to both Yehuda and Kepha, but Kepha's heart belonged to Yeshua, and Hasatan couldn't enter him. It's a very important point. He could enter Judah's heart, but he couldn't enter Peter's heart. Kepha belongs to the master, and here Yeshua is already prophesying Kepha's restoration after his denial in verse 32. And you, once you have turned back in repentance, strengthen your brothers. The word doesn't say Hasatan enter Kepha. Again, only Yehuda. See, Kepha belongs to Yeshua, and it wounds him when he realizes what he has done. So reading towards the end of chapter 22 in Luke, verses 60 to 62. But Kepha said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And instantly, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Kepha. You know the look. And Kepha remembered what the Lord had said. And before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And what did he do? He went outside. He cried bitterly. And Kepha's tears are the evidence of a true follower of Yeshua. True guilt, true shame, true remorse. True Yehuda, be, uh, we could say that Judah, well, wait, did Judah become remorseful too? Didn't he regret what he did? Well, in some sense, but he was more worried about the consequences than experiencing any shame. He even tried to give the money back. But he doesn't repent from his heart. He was trying to deal with the consequences of his choice, and he was smart enough to realize this is going to bite him in the tuchus. But he decided, you know, but it didn't change his attitude. It's like what happens to us many times. It's more not that we regret what we did. It's because we got caught doing it. We regret getting caught. And that, I think, is the spirit of Yehuda. He tries to atone for his own sin. You know how he does it, by taking his own life. And Kepha, however, repents. He weeps from a broken heart, but he can't atone for his own sin. Three days later, when he hears Yeshua isn't in the tomb, what does he do? He runs to it. He runs to the tomb. But even after Yeshua appears to his Talmud, including Kepha, in a locked room, he remains ashamed, not feeling he has been forgiven. 
Yochanan's gospel tells us Kepha returns to the Galil to fish. Went back to being a fisherman. I'm going back home. I'm going to go fishing. It's there that Yeshua appears to him together uh, with some of the other Talmudim on the shore of Lake Tiberias. We read from the Gospel of John or Yochanan, chapter 21, verse 15 to 17, after breakfast, Yeshua said to Shimon Kepha, Shimon bar Yochanan, do you love me? <laughs> do you love me more than these? He replied, yes, Lord, you, you know I'm your friend, he said to him. Well, then feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Yeshua, Shimon bar Yochanan, do you love me? He replied, yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend, he said to him, then shepherd my sheep. And then the third time he said to him, Shimon bar Yochanan, are you my friend? Shimon was hurt that he questioned him a third time, are, are, are you my friend? So he replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I'm your friend. And Yeshua said to him, then feed my sheep. And the good news for Kepha and for the rest of us, Yeshua offers restoration to any follower who denies him. So you remember, remember in, even at the moment Yeshua or Judas kisses Yeshua, again, he affords him the opportunity to repent by asking him, if, are you really betraying me? You sure that's what's going on here? And Yeshua asked Kepha three times if he loves him. Walking Kepha back through the three denials. Three times he denied him. Three times he confessed him. Three times. Three times to repent and follow him. Yeshua can turn the worst, the worst of us that are deniers into the best of disciples. That's what's so important about what I have to say. No matter how bad you are, no matter how far you've drifted, no matter what degree of denial is in your life, he can redeem you. And he can make you not only maybe the worst denier, but the best disciple. Look at Kepha. I don't care. I don't care if you've put your faith in him and haven't told the soul. Or maybe you've even pretended like you don't know Yeshua. Yeshua can forgive you anyway and restore you and turn you into the best Tommy. I, I don't think, I don't think that uh, Yeshua is going to magically take away all of our fears and anxieties. I don't think that's going to happen. We're still going to have them. We're still going to have our degree of shame, but by his grace and the power of his Ruach HaKodesh, his Holy Spirit, we can work through it. We can work through it. So what's your story this morning? What's your story? You're probably not going to tell me, but who do you need to talk to? Who have you been avoiding talking to? Where have you denied Yeshua in your own life and need to walk that path again? Where is that? Where's that place, that person, that opportunity? Maybe you should pray for it to happen again. You know, on the shore of Lake Tiberias, Yeshua walked Kepha back through his denials. All three of them. But he also promised that one day he would give Kepha another opportunity to walk with him to the execution tree. Thank you for that. <laughs> but to face the same fears from the night of the Passover and this time prevail, not fail. Yochanan 21, yes, indeed, I tell you, when you were younger, Speaking of Kepha, you put on your clothes and went where you wanted. Isn't that what happens with a lot of people today? You put on your clothes and go where you want. Right? But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And he said this to indicate the kind of death by which Kepha would bring glory to God. And then Yeshua said to him, follow me. Follow me. See, Yeshua is prophesying. He's prophesying Kepha will die like he did on the execution tree. 
And history tells us that Cepha indeed did die by crucifixion after becoming a bold, bold disciple or Talmud of Yeshua. He shared the good news boldly. He shared the way of Yeshua and he saw God at work and, and you can too. You can too. Yeshua, as I said, can turn the worst of us, the worst deniers, into the most amazing disciples. Yeshua can do this because he was tempted. Remember that? He was also tempted to deny God's plan. Hasatan tried to get him, tried to get to him, tried to get him to turn on his heavenly father, but Yeshua wouldn't do that. He wouldn't turn on him. Yeshua walked down the path God planned for him, and he never stumbled, and he never fell. And it was on the Feast of Matzah, two deniers are revealed. Two deniers are revealed on the Feast of Matzah. One denial, the result of a hardened heart, and the other, the result of a broken heart. I guess the question for this Hag Hamatzot is, which one are you? Which one really are you? Do you have the hardened heart? Are you just worried about the consequences? Or do you have the broken heart, one of shame and remorse and regret? Now, if you repent of your sins and you put your faith and trust in Yeshua, you will receive Yeshua's unfaltering record on your account. We're not saved by being bold for Yeshua, so don't read in what I'm saying. That doesn't guarantee salvation. There's always a lot of people going out there going, Lord, Lord, and he said, I don't know you. So don't feel that your, your labor is going to get you into the kingdom. I promise you it won't. I'm grateful for all you that do wonderful good deeds and generous giving, but those deeds won't get you anywhere. They won't get you anywhere. You're not saved by being bold for Yeshua. We're saved by our confession and God's grace. It's no conspiracy theory, brothers and sisters. This is truth. This is truth. So here's your choice today. You're always left with a choice. It's my job. You can either harden your heart and suffer the consequences denying him, or you can invite Yeshua's grace and mercy to heal your broken heart and declare him. Deny him or declare him. I guess that's your choice. My suggestion as the rabbi on this Hakak Matzot, my suggestion is to declare him. Love Yeshua through this holiday season and beyond fully and feed his sheep with the truth of the bread of life. Please rise.